communicated with you uh, via LinkedIn and through email. And uh, everyone, I just want to welcome Claire Armstrong. Uh, no relation to me that I know of, anyway. And uh, we uh, no uh, relation. <laughs> uh, and Claire is a reporter for the Daily Telegraph in Australia. And so, Claire, I'll throw it to you for a minute if you can uh, tell us a little bit about um, your daily routine, whatever you would like to, and then I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to answer as many questions as people have um, towards to, yeah, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction. So I'm a, a, the Daily Telegraph is a tabloid newspaper in Australia. It is um, based, the main city that it focuses on is Sydney, which people will probably know about. It's the one with the Harbour Bridge and all of the big sort of famous landmarks uh, in terms of cities in Australia. We are the biggest city in the country. Um, and when I say we're a tabloid newspaper, it means that we are a daily newspaper that comes out rather than, I guess, in, I'm trying to think of a comparable, um, we have broadsheets. So for example, something like the New York Times for you guys would be like a, a big broadsheet, whereas the New York Post would be a tabloid. We're not quite to the uh, level of it of gives you a sense of the kind of newspaper we are. So um, my Today I am based normally, not at the moment, but normally I'm based in Canberra, which is where um, our parliament is. So the same as being based in Washington DC, I suppose. So I have an office in Parliament House. I um, spent my round, I guess, is covering federal politics. So the federal level of government, I therefore deal with, we have a prime minister. So um, when parliament is sitting, I'm covering that looking at what legislation is being passed, um, dealing with the Prime Minister on sort of big major national issues, like of course the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's been, I would say, the bulk of my year this year. But day to day, I um, start my day in the morning, get my head across the news, um, and from pretty much 9 a.m. onwards, I'm either, so at the moment we have what's called Senate Estimates, which is we had our budget two weeks ago. And in the immediate aftermath of our budget, the Senate gets to question all of the bureaucrats and the ministers who made, which uh, ministers would be, they're kind of in charge of all the different portfolios who made the budget. So then they get interrogated, you know, why did you spend this money here? What made you decide to go with this particular tax? Um, why did this company get a contract? All of those kinds of things that were, that come after the, the budget. So we're in, in that process at the moment, um, which basically involves watching a lot of committees. Uh, but day to day, I'm, I'm covering parliament when it's sitting, when it's not sitting, I'm still often talking to local representatives, particularly ones that are in the area that my newspaper covers because they have a lot of uh, issues. For example, at the moment, um, we have a really big review that is coming out tomorrow on the bushfires from last summer, which everyone probably saw a bit on the news over December, January, this like just gone. Um, so we had a big uh, inquiry into what happened, why they were so bad, what could be done better next time. Um, and the, there's a report that's coming out tomorrow. So for example, I'm actually out on the road because of that in some of the areas that were quite badly burned over the summer to talk to some of the people that were affected and um, get their reaction so that when the report lands tomorrow, we've got some, I guess, not just politicians speaking to it, but some of the people that were actually affected. So it's a really mixed bag. The, the press gallery that covers politics in parliament in Australia probably has 30 or 40 journalists, which is, is not many <laughs> covering, and that's television, radio, newspaper, online, the whole kind of gambit um, and we yeah we're, we're very busy at the moment it's a very busy time but they all cover different parts of of the country so for example oh, we're all based in Canberra the capital but there'll be people that work for um, you know the Melbourne paper 
or the Perth paper or Darwin, like they all uh, obviously write for a, an audience that's very different. So it can be a really eclectic group of people. Um, in terms of literally what I do, I guess the, the structure of my day, um, I'm constantly talking to people, looking through reports, talking to politicians, you get tips from readers. Um, and the structure of how our newspaper is, it comes together is I have, I, my I report to a chief of staff so that my chief of staff um, talks to all of the reporters and she's kind of the filter between us and our story ideas and the editor so rather than have the editor be dealing with every tiny brainwave that one of their reporters has it gets filtered through the chief of staff so I'll have conversations with her from sort of nine in the morning at 10 in the morning, she goes into a conference, news conference meeting with herself, the editor of um, like photography, the actual newspaper editor, um, and then there'll be like a sport editor, some of those big kind of higher positions. And they have a preliminary discussion. Um, and she will say, oh, Claire's covering bushfires today. She's getting this, you know, talking to this person. This is what she thinks she's going to get. And the editor will go, oh, that sounds really good. That could be, you know, a possible front page or it could be, you know, a good picture story on page three. And they kind of have a preliminary discussion about what the paper might look like. And then she comes out of that meeting. If there's any feedback, for example, um, they'll go, oh, that's really good. But can you get a business owner to, you know, talk about the impact and kind of give you a bit more feedback on what they want. And then um, at two o'clock, my chief of staff and everyone else meets again. And that's when they go, okay, Claire's story is going, uh, going to be the main story on page three. It's going to have a picture. It's going to be 450 words or it's going to be on page 10. It's going to be 80 words. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, and, and then I go away from sort of 2.30, 3 o'clock onwards and I write to the length that I've been given and we sort of start filing and um, particularly at the moment with... Um, uh, the, the way I guess that journalism in Australia has been coping with the last few years of the downturn of journalism where people aren't really paying for news and it's not a lot of ads being sold is that we have increasingly earlier deadlines. So when I first started writing for newspapers about five years ago, I'd often get away with not filing the final version of my story until 7 or 7.30 p.m. Now I start to get this sort of email saying, where's, where's that copy at about five o'clock? Because the way they've compensated is to cut a lot of what we call sub-editors. So they're the ones who read my work, not just spell check and, and those kinds of things, but try and, I guess, sometimes spice it up a little bit if I haven't written it very well or make slight sort of just cosmetic changes. Um, rather than have a lot of them do all of that work at 7.30 p.m., we have a smaller number that start doing that work from sort of 5 p.m., which is why they want that copy coming in earlier in the day. Sometimes there's stories that, of course, they just break really late and there's nothing you can do about that. So that, you know, they get the story when they get the story. So our first edition goes to print at 8 p.m. So it goes out, gets printed, uh, chucked on trucks, New South Wales, the state that I cover is a very big state. So the, the paper gets printed and the first edition gets chucked on a truck and it starts driving in all directions for hours and hours and hours. Uh, then we have a second edition that isn't until 10.30. So that's often, um, for example, if you have a late night sport game, the first edition, unlikely to have the result. Second edition, it'll have, you know, where things are up to or, you know, a bit about it, but second edition would have the results. Or if there's an election even, second edition would be more likely to have uh, results, particularly uh, our state or smaller local council elections where you get a, a result turned around faster. Um, or if there's a late night, you know, a, a, a crime or something at, a, at 9, 10 p.m. at a club or something, that'll make the second, second edition. So that's the one that hard deadline is 10.30 p.m. And that goes out into the city itself. So the people in the city get the latest edition. Um, so it's kind of the mechanics, I guess, of how it works. I don't sit around till 10.30 p.m. every day. Um, usually after first, uh, around first edition or when I filed, I tend to go home. But that doesn't mean that sometimes I don't, something doesn't happen at seven or eight o'clock at night and I get a call and I'm back on my laptop at home on the couch 
you know, filing for second edition. Um, but I try to avoid that. that it kind of has to be a big deal. I think the last time that I had to do that, some news had broken that uh, uh, basically a Chinese cyber terror group had hacked into one of our state government's uh, computers. So with that, I randomly found out about that at about 8 or 9 p.m. one night. And of course, I quickly got out my computer and filed on that. But uh, that that's a bit of a, an extreme exception. So I guess in terms of the, the daily mechanics, that's what I do. That's how the paper works. But I'm really happy to answer questions. I've worked at several different papers across the country. I've done a bit of radio. I go on TV a little bit uh, as like a commentator. I TV, um, a lot of the programs here like having print journalists come on and sort of offer analysis. So I've got that experience. Um, obviously, I went to university here, studied journalism. I studied international relations and political science as well. So any questions about any of that or just how politics works here or what I think of politics in the States, happy to, to answer questions. Uh, one kind of quick question. I ask this partly because uh, coronavirus continues to be such a, a big story here in the States, and I'm sure it is in Australia as well. And currently we're going through another really large spike in the United States, and we never really came out of the first wave. I mean, it never really has um, exactly gone down all that much. And so I just wanted to ask you, how is uh, COVID currently in Australia and how has the coronavirus impacted your job? Yeah, so uh, bizarrely, um, coronavirus, I'm probably one of the few professions in the country that somehow, you know, me and, and obviously health workers got busier as everyone else started shutting down and, and being furloughed. So we um, had a, a it's, it's interesting, we've had very different results to the United States, but at key points had very similar um, decisions and very similar debates, but they went different ways. So we, um, I, from the, tw I actually looked this up the other day, on the 12th of January, I wrote a story about an unknown new disease that the United States had started temperature screening um, for at certain airports and that we in Australia weren't screening for, and there were people here saying, oh, Australia needs to screen for this. So right from the off, you guys were slightly ahead of us. Um, and then we quickly closed our borders, first to China, um, a, a slightly before you guys did, um, only slightly, um, in the sense that we started requiring any Australians or Australia or people that had a visa to live in Australia had to quarantine at home for two weeks and anyone that wasn't from Australia could not come from first Wuhan and then larger China. And then very quickly, we did the same for those first initial hotspot areas, Iran, Italy, um, a couple, uh, South Korea, those kinds of countries. So in that early stage, we were much the same as you guys couple cases here or there, figuring out what was happening. Once we started to have some serious issues, and that was when we had a couple of cruise ships come back early on in sort of March with a lot of pe people that had the virus. And honestly, a lot of people coming back from the United States were bringing the virus. <laughs> we got to about April and we completely, or end of March, we completely closed our borders. So right now it is not possible for any of you to come to Australia. The, the international border is closed. So we turned the tap off, but of course that couldn't stop Australian citizens returning home. So what we've been dealing with ever since is Australian citizens returning home and bringing the virus. So we had initially in where I, I cover Sydney, had a big wave, big first wave because we're the big population center. Um, we were had a few outbreaks in aged care, a few hundred deaths, um, it was looking pretty dire and we went into, the whole country went into lockdown. So um, unless you were an essential worker, which that's what I was class, my uh, my boss actually wrote a letter saying that, you know, if the police pull you over, Claire Armstrong is a journalist. She is, um, you know, out of her home doing essential work. And I would have to show that if we got pulled over. But for a couple of months, you could leave the home to exercise, to go to the shops, um, to seek medical care or emergency care. Uh, and when I say go to the shops, I mean grocery store. I don't mean going clothes shopping. 
um, and pubs, clubs, gyms, everything all closed. Retail, all closed. Um, everyone was home. We had like a furlough job uh, wage subsidy program. So a lot of people who lost their jobs, um, the government paid their employers to pass on a portion of the wage to keep them technically on the books, even though they weren't doing work. And then in about July, when we were down to basically no cases, we set up a very aggressive contact tracing and testing system. Um, when in about July, we suppressed the first wave, we started reopening, but there was a, a mismanaged outbreak in Melbourne, the second biggest city in Australia. And they had a second wave that was much, much bigger than the entire rest of what Australia had had the first time. And actually just yesterday, so that started in June in that second wave in, in one state and all the other states closed their borders to that state to stop it spreading. So we've had sort of a relatively okay, I would say living with COVID environment where I am um, in Canberra, that's things like uh, obviously no handshaking and hugging and all of that. But you can go into a restaurant, but they have a rule, like the tables are very spaced out and you have to sign in so that if there ever is a case, they can like find you and contact trace you. You know, lots of hand sanitizer. Uh, big major events still not on, big sporting events still have no crowds. You know, music festivals are probably not coming back for a while. But it was only Victoria that had a second wave. And actually just yesterday for the first time, they had zero community transmission cases. So um, we're at the point now where we're back to where we were in July, which is that the, the virus is largely suppressed. We're getting two or three cases nationally a day and everyone is living to, a, to an extent, living with the virus. But of course, if international travel returns, that brings the virus back. And there's a lot of debate on at the moment about what it means in terms of if we wait until a vaccine or if our economy can afford that because we're a very service driven economy one of the one of our biggest import exports for example is higher education so we make a lot of money out of university like chinese students coming here for university and obviously we've banned them from coming at the moment so we've had very a similar trajectory on lower figures of a much lower base we've, we've not had the disaster that you guys have had but a lot of the same debates, you know, when can the kids go back to school? All of those things, we had all of that. We just obviously had a slightly different outcome. Yeah, I think you just said that you were having like two or three cases a day in the country Is that right now. I think, well, I think, yeah. I think Friday, yes. the United States had 60,000. And so, yeah, yeah so that's. Yeah, well, we had much of the same debate. You know, we had a lot of people saying you can't shut down everyone. You can't punish young people because of something that's only affecting old people. There was a lot of the exact same arguments. We just happened to, uh, I guess, in general, have a society that overall was much more happy to listen to our health professionals. And the person that was like the Australian equivalent of Dr. Fauci basically ran the country here for a couple of months. Like the prime minister didn't make a single decision that wasn't based off what that sort of head doctor had said, which is obviously I think where you guys started to diverge from us in about March. All right, well, actually, I think that's a, uh, actually that's just fascinating information. Thank you for sharing all of that. And I, uh, <laughs> and that's actually a pretty good segue to my next question that, uh, you know, coming from an, international media perspective and you mentioned you know that you studied political science um what is your view from that media perspective when you would look at the political scene in the united states and i just am kind of curious how it's perceived yeah i would say um so i uh i'm heavily engaged in the US election. You know, I, I've watched the debates. I actually do, I sometimes do work here with the US embassy when we cover sort of cross issues because they obviously have a, a, a program where they try and get, you know, international interest in their political process. It's kind of part of the soft diplomacy side of work that they do. So I've been particularly engaged with, with this election in my role here and, I'd say that most people I would say on 
balance, you wouldn't have uh, all of Australian politics to begin with are probably slightly more to the left than the, the baseline of the US. So the center here is slightly more left than the center where you guys are. We definitely still have that spread to, uh, to conservative and that spread to quite extreme left, but as a baseline, the, the, our liberal party spelled with a big L, it's very confusing, they're our conservative party, would not on the whole match up with the Republicans. The Republicans probably overall skew slightly more conservative, particularly on some of those social issues. For example, we have universal healthcare here and have had so for like longer than my lifetime. So <laughs> there are some debates, I guess, that are just settled here. So that is why I, I, I say that to, so that when I say most people in Australia cannot understand how Trump was elected, don't understand how he is even remotely within a shot um, again, it's because it's just a, it's a whole, we're, we're just slightly to the left of how that could happen. We have plenty of Trump-esque characters in our political uh in our parliament for example but they they sit on the back bench and they make a lot of noise and they yell xenophobic things about china and they don't like uh you know a lot of things that the center government does but they're not leading the country so we have the we have that spectrum but we don't have that person leading the country i think there's a real perception here in australia that of disbelief that uh someone like that could end up leading the states um and it, it, it has become, it's definitely not um, affect the day-to-day -day life or how people perceive Americans, but it, it is um, definitely, I think, Australians, and probably bizarrely has engaged us a lot more in your politics because, I mean, and I often see this when I watch uh, a lot of US television, particularly the cable news, you know, everyone's always talking about Trump, like you talk about him constantly because he does so many crazy things, you know, we has a Twitter rant or something like that. So we actually end up talking about quite as well. Like we still have those conversations. Oh my God, you know. I mean, did you see what Kanye West wrote on Twitter and then the presidential race, the perception from Australia and, and my perception is definitely one of sort of uh, not it, on a very Get it. Uh, but from my personal point of view, on top of the law scene, franchising of the sort of working class, uh, not in a city centre, you know, the, the kind of the issue you've got with your agricultural belt, you have a lot of those same kind of disaffected population groups here as well. There's, I guess, we don't have of an electoral college system elevate vote to the extent that you then really have, uh, I guess, almost overemphasize some of those opinions. So a lot of the underlying, I guess, things that motivate like Trump, I think they exist in a lot of democracies at the moment every day here in Australia. We just have like world office in the land. All right, and toward the end of that you were you were breaking up about a little bit, but we definitely got the uh, definitely got the gist of what you were saying. Oh, I think we lost her. I'm sure she'll I'm sure she'll join us again in just a second. <laughs> yeah, there she comes. <laughs> Sorry, we lost you for a second. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, I did say that I'm in a very small town that has really bad internet. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I mean that, that we we encounter that every day, and you know most of the people that we have on our zooms are like maybe across our city, and so you know so you're <laughs> oh, so you're in Australia, so very understandable. Um, let's see. Well, I have some other questions, but I wanted to uh, open it up to. Uh, some of the others on the uh, group and see if we have some questions from them. 
I have a question. Go ahead, Joshua. Okay. Um, according to your analysis or statistics about COVID-19 in Australia, do you think it's been handled properly or there's maybe they feel they don't need to take enough action about it? Oh, I think she's... Sorry, could you just say that again? It just cut out. Oh, okay. Um, I said, according to your analysis about um, the COVID-19 cases in Australia, do you think it's been handled properly mm -hmm. or there's anything maybe... Do you think it's been handled properly? Let me just leave it as that. I would say for the most part, it's been handled as best as it can. We've had three, I would say we've had three really, uh, and again, I have to say, we are not having the same level of cases and deaths that you guys are having. So when I say it's a crisis here, it probably it really doesn't translate, but I would say we, we have overall handled it incredibly well. We have, for example, um, I don't have my phone near me. We all have or, uh, about 7 million of us and there are 25 million people in Australia have an app on our phone that, or a Facebook or anything like that. It's a government app that I voluntarily put on my phone and it collects de-identified information about any other phone with that app that I come into contact with for 15 minutes or longer so that if I ever get COVID, the person that was in the same room as me gets an automatic call from a health professional saying, hey, you were next to someone that had COVID. So we have an incredibly, like we have that digital technology, we have health care workers that are lots of contacting. So a lot of it has been handled incredibly well. And from so the first was the return of cruise ships. We let a bunch of people off move all over the country. And that was basically how our first wave started because we didn't make them quarantine properly. We screwed it up and that was what resulted in our first that was our first screw up. That's when we down on making sure that people return to hotel quarantine. So when you arrive internationally from Australia at the moment, you are automatically taken put in a hotel and you're put up there for two weeks and you cannot leave. The police got it. You can't leave. Like it's not pleasant, but it is that we couldn't necessarily trust everyone to do the right thing coming back from overseas. The other issue we had was with aged care. We have a very like skewing aged population, a lot of people in nursing homes. And the first time, uh, and more. Oh, I think she's gone. Yeah, she'll be back in a minute, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, like I was telling, like I was telling her, you know, this is what we deal with every day, and you know. Yes. She's not. She's not exactly just across town, so. <laughs> yeah, it's happening. I want to know what city is she from. Okay, she's back. Sorry, I'm back. I don't know how much of that you heard. Uh, most of it. Yeah, you got most cool. of it. And yeah. So. Uh, what Sorry, city are you from again? Oh, so I I am from. <laughs> well, I I am living in Canberra, which is uh, in the middle is the capital, the capital city of Australia. I'm actually from Tasmania, which um, I don't know if you know the tiny little triangle island at the bottom of Australia. That's where I'm from. Um, but I moved to the mainland when I finished high school. Uh, but yes, I guess to summarise, do I think Australia has co handled COVID well? Yes. Um, when you look at the data, you might think, oh my God, how are those numbers so low? But, but they're very accurate. We, um, we've had no, when you look at excess deaths and other ways of assessing the impact, we have handled it incredibly well. We've only failed in that initial dealing with people coming from overseas. And then in aged care, we basically had to get to a point where we banned 
visitors into aged care when it was really bad, which was obviously really awful for a lot of elderly people who couldn't see their families, but it was the sort of trade-off that we decided to make. All right, well, thank, thank you for that. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you, Joshua, for your question. Other questions? Hi. I have oh, Amy, you go first. Um, I was just going to ask, I actually have a friend in Australia, she live in Victoria, so mm -hmm. um, like how she been telling me, it's like you guys still have curfew and, and so what phase will you consider you, um, your country it's in right now and then I really want to know what's your point of view um, on how the government is um, dealing with um, COVID-19 in your country comparing to um, the American um, policy, how, mm -hmm. I don't know how to speak. Yeah, I know what you mean. So yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I sort of breezed over that part about Victoria. So when I explained that, that Victoria had a second wave that was bigger and worse than the entire rest of the country. Uh, they had their premier, which I guess is like the governor, um, who actually, so uh, we have much the same issue that you have here actually, where a lot of the main uh, parts of government that are relevant in a COVID crisis like this are actually at a state level, not at a federal level. So we had the premier of Victoria in response to, they, uh, so Melbourne is a city of about 5 million people. And at their worst, they were getting eight, 900 cases a day and dozens of deaths. It was really quite bad for the size of the city that it was. So he imposed an incredibly harsh lockdown. Um, what I discussed before in terms of only being able to leave for exercise, grocery shopping, healthcare, that kind of thing. But he went even further imposing a, a curfew. So I think from eight or 10 p.m., you couldn't go out. Uh, exercise you could only go within five kilometers I don't know what that is in miles from your home so you couldn't cross the whole city or go all the way to the beach or something you had to just stay within a five kilometer radius of your home and um, you could only go out for an hour and the people in Victoria lived through that for more than 100 days and actually just yesterday when they got down to zero cases their premier announced that they're starting to relax of the lockdown. So yeah, your friend in Victoria would have had a pretty horrible last three months with a very, I would say very similar to New Zealand style of lockdown. And that was a decision that that state made to get on top of the virus in their state. So while that was happening, people in other states that didn't have that level of outbreak were just existing on this small COVID normal level with lots of hand sanitizer and staying 1.5 meters away from, from people. Um, how do I think the government has responded directly in comparison to the US? I would say, think of any time you have seen on the news that an advisor told Trump one thing and he did another, that Fauci said one thing and Trump advised another or Pence led his task force to do something else on masks, on contact tracing, Thing, made the wrong decision I would say made the right one um, at the start of the very early days of the pandemic in February March we were in a very similar position we didn't have much PPE we didn't have many ventilators we had no like we, we had no idea what we were dealing with in terms of contact tracing with something this infectious but we basically got the best infectious disease experts into a room the government gave some health officials effectively a blank check and just said, go and buy as many masks, gowns, uh, ventilators as you can. We got private industry to that normally manufactures other things to start making those kinds of products. There's a, a factory uh, in one of the states that actually makes all of the takeaway containers for KFC. And they switched and started making masks and shields and things like that. There was another company that makes um, sleeping for people that have like snoring issues and sleep issues. And you have like a mask sleep apnea thing that you go to bed with. They stopped making those and started making medical grade ventilators. So we had a basically, I would say at every point that the government 
over in America probably was slow on making a decision or was resistant on something like masks. We were the opposite. We went very quickly down whatever path the experts had advised. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I have a question and it's more so based on just your journalism background, but um, I myself am a student journalist here at our university and I would just like to know what your biggest advice is in terms of just journalism in general for young um, people who want to get into the career and then specifically advice for people who want to do like political reporting. Cool. Well, you've picked an incredibly challenging career path, so best of luck to you, but a very rewarding one. Um, all the best things that are always hard to work for. So um, I was much the same. I decided, uh, you know, I was uh, in high school. I was good at English and writing. So I thought that I wanted to be a journalist. I was on my school paper. I picked uh, to study journalism after school and was much the same, got involved in whatever sort of student type uh, media activities that there were. Um, and I think that's a big part of it is uh, it's horrible, but you have to do a lot of work for free. Like any internship that you can get your hands on, I cannot understate how valuable that is. But then also if you are lucky enough to get an internship and it, and I'm talking some of the places that I interned when I was at university would be like a community radio station that probably had 20 listeners and one of them would have been my mum. Like they were not big media organisations. I wasn't lining up to go and try and be, you know, on our big news stations or anything like that. Um, so the most experience, the more experience you can get, I cannot understate how important it is because as much as you can learn some really good base level skills at university it's just not the same you know you go to university you get an assignment uh i you know i remember laughing once we had a go write an 800 word feature on you know whatever you want and we had three months to do it the assignment wasn't due for three months i mean i'm lucky if i get a day in in the real world to turn something like that around so um, I think getting, a, I cannot understate how important it is, but also once you get there, not being afraid to put yourself in it and ask a lot of questions. In my later times when I was at newspapers, I'd often get into, I, often the more junior people in the office end up being the ones that oversee the interns. So I'd have, uh, I could see instantly if someone was going to have a chance because you'd have some interns that had come in and be very polite, get their computer log in and sit there for the week, always do whatever they were asked, but never volunteered more than that. We're never like, hey, is there anything I can do? Or, hey, I saw this idea. I think it could be a good story. Like, oh, could I work? You know, it's about being proactive once you get into those situations. So experience is the first thing. The second thing is, I, and I, I don't know exactly how this would apply so much in the States, but um, I have never stayed in the same city for a job, I don't think. So I left Tasmania when I finished high school because it was a small, small place that had not much work and had really high unemployment. There was one local paper. I, I wasn't, I don't know, I just wasn't, I was 18 and stupid and I thought I would be better than it. So I moved. And I moved to the mainland, did my degree and uh, was actually straight out of university. I got a cadetship, which is like a one year make or break Hunger Games type situation where they hire like eight cadets and they go at the end of the year, one of you will have a job. And you kind of just spend this whole year being like, oh, my God, I've got to do everything I possibly can. Um, and I didn't make it. You know, I wasn't one of the the eight people. I, I, I wasn't the one out of the eight that, that got the job. Um, and, but I stuck around, I moved into Sydney's, I moved into the regions, you know, I moved to places, the population was 10,000 people and I was writing, <laughs> writing an entire paper by myself. So I think, um, but the way I got into politics was that I just started showing an interest in it and writing about it. I mean, I always knew that I wanted to do it, but, um, my first two years in journalism, I broke the crime round. You know, I chased police cars around the city. 
Um, it wasn't what I wanted to do, but it got me in the paper every day. It got my writing better. It got me good at interviewing people. Um, and trust me, the, the prime minister can yell at me in a press conference. And he does, you know, not just Trump exclusively reserved for yelling at journalists in press conferences. And it just doesn't bother me because I spent all of those years, you know, door knocking the parents of a kid that had just been killed or, you know, dealing with a car accident or actual really horrible damaging things that make you really resilient. So I would say, yes, absolutely make decisions that you think are going to get you closer to politics. If you get, if you end up in an organization and you think, Hey, you guys don't really cover the council very much, you know, start covering the council. Uh, don't expect to be sent to, you know, Washington on your <laughs> first day, but don't necessarily discount the random skills that you can acquire in other areas along the way because they are very transferable even if they don't seem like it at the time I don't know if that answers the last part but feel free yes thank you (laughs) I just wanted to ask and you mentioned you touched on this just a moment ago but um, you know, it's no, it's no real secret. The current United States uh, administration, current president, has an incredibly adversarial relationship with the media. Um, how is that tone in Australia? I mean, do you, in other words, you know, what do you, um, what sort of relationship does the uh, government have with the press? I guess is the. Yeah, well, much the same as you guys. It obviously sort of administration to administration changes. I actually was talking to a member of staff in the Prime Minister's office about this just the other day because uh, I can't remember the context but we must have had in our press pack someone from overseas for some reason and they were uh, I think a bit put out by how aggressive particularly our press conferences with the Prime Minister can be. And this person, he's travelled around with our Prime Minister quite a lot. And he said that in terms of the most aggressive, antagonistic, and that's not just coming from the leader down, that's from the journalists yelling up as well. He ranked them as uh, Washington DC being the the most intense. Uh, And then he put Canberra on par with what Boris Johnson deals with in the UK and then he said there's daylight and you know everyone else (laughs) (laughs) similar press pack and it's something that is actually only really unique to the capital here you get it a little bit in some of the other bigger cities when they're dealing with their state leaders but it's you know I've worked in country towns and if I started yelling at people the way that I yell at people here or if I, I would say the difference is we don't have the personal insult level that Trump brings to his press conferences. Although having said that, our current prime minister has a, uh, his media strategy, I guess you would call it, is if he gets asked something that he doesn't like and doesn't want to answer, his first port of call will be to go, he has a, a favourite catchphrase, I guess, not quite to the same level of draining the swamp, but he calls things the Canberra bubble. So, so for example, so we're in Canberra and he thinks that we all live in this bubble where we care about tiny part of Australia cares about. So for example, the other day, um, his uh, a, a, a um, minister of his got in trouble for handing out a lot of grants without there really being any proceeds that had his party were getting a lot of this money. So obviously a lot of the journalists wanted to ask a lot more about this and the Prime Minister's response would be, well, that's just the Canberra bubble. Like no one in the real world cares about that. So he's not being personally aggressive, but he is trying to be dismissive. And then he'll pivot. So if someone comes back the next day and asks the same question, you know, um, he'll, oh, Claire, of course you would ask that kind of question. You know, it tries to diminish it a little. So I'd say that is his slightly Trump-esque trait and everyone has one. 
Uh, every leader has one, but that is probably, it's not to the extent of like the, the bizarre um, antagonism that Trump directly shows to specific journalists. Um, and I think in general, it's it's a bit more tame, although we have had a few like viral TikToks from the PM like yelling at certain journalists and things. So you know, it's it's not quite as extreme, but and, and, and overall, I think there is an expectation in Australia that um, with the way our Westminster system kind of works, the buck stops with the minister. So be that the prime minister or the environment or the energy or the education minister, if something messes up in their portfolio, there's no deferring to anyone else. Like you are the person that's responsible for that. So there is a base level expectation that I suppose is a bit different. And um, yeah, the government, they uh, probably pull a lot of the same tricks as what happens in the States. They just may be a bit more nuanced about it. <laughs> and uh, we're getting close to the end of the time, but I wanted to ask, you know, it's no secret journalism is a very stressful profession. And so what do you do in uh, for your leisure activities? What do you do to de-stress? Yes, um, that's a really hard question in 2020. Um, okay, I should well, say when we're not in 2020. Yes. Well, well even so, um, I I try to so I try to have at least a day out of my two days off. So the other thing I should probably preface there is. Um, journalists don't really have weekends off they don't have public holidays I mean we still get the, the equivalent amount of time but um, I, I often have people surprised I work most Sundays and they can't understand it and I sort of say well how do you think the Monday newspaper gets written you know we don't all get up at two in the morning and quickly write a newspaper we have to do it the day before so um, when I do have time off it's really in line with everyone else that has a Saturday and a Sunday off so I try and at least have days off where I turn my phone off and it doesn't matter if the prime minister himself is calling, I am answering. Um, and then I just get back to like all the same normal things. You know, I play sport, I have friends, do whatever you got to do to just have a bit of fun, talk to my family, doing a lot of Zooms at the moment, as I'm sure everyone is. <laughs> um, uh, all, all the normal things. But I think the really important one is you have to, just step away from the news and it can be so hard particularly if there's an ongoing issue and you've been at the front line of it for five days and all of a sudden you have to wake up the next day and pretend like it's not happening but I think that being able to step back a little bit and that's not to say that I don't still read the paper every day watch the news check in online but I'm just not being as aggressively involved because I think you would just drive yourself insane if you were connected all the time. So a bit of disconnect, a bit of a detox from the phone. Um, I look I look at my phone usage on my iPhone and through the week it'll be like this and then it just drops for my two days off and then picks right back up again. So it's more about what I don't do than, than what I do, I suppose. Well, very good. Uh, well, looking at the time, I see that we are at 8.02 Eastern Standard Time. And so I will wrap up this Media Monday. But Claire, I thank you so much for, for taking the time to join us. I mean, it's such an insightful conversation to, um, you know, just hear from, hear your take from Australia. I mean, it's just, just, just fascinating. And again, just a, a world of thanks for joining us this evening. Yeah, absolutely. And you obviously have my email. Please feel free to students if they have any questions I'm more than happy to um, answer them uh, I, I know it can be a bit daunting on a zoom environment and you only think of things later so absolutely spread my email around I'm, I'm happy for people to reach out great I'll, I will share it with the students and so well again thank you very much thanks everybody for joining us and I guess with that I'll shut up and I'll see some of you virtually later thank you thank you so much thanks so much guys you bye-bye.